Hello, and so happy to have you join us. I'm your moderator, Faith Rogers with DKB Med. Uh, you're in for a great presentation today with excellent faculty who I will introduce you shortly. Uh, we've been developing COVID education since March of 2020. So more than two years and hundreds of COVID-19 webinars later, uh, we're incredibly grateful for the progress we've made in managing patients during this pandemic. So. Okay, so here are those great faculty I mentioned earlier. For those of you who have been with us since the beginning, uh, you'll recognize Dr. Allwater. Uh, he'll give us an update on the state of COVID-19 therapeutics uh, and a little bit about monkeypox after Dr. Williams, who I'm happy to introduce to our learners today. Uh, she's our first presenter and we'll be discussing um, post-acute se se sequel sequelae of SARS-CoV-2 infection, uh, also known as PASC uh, syndrome, what we commonly refer to as long COVID. Uh, so Dr. Williams, Dr. Allwater, thank you for taking time out of your busy practices to be uh, here with me today. Okay, so here are the faculty's disclosures. Um, this educational activity is supported by an independent educational grant from Gilead Sciences Incorporated. All activity content and materials have been developed solely by the planning committee members, as well as the faculty presenters. Please note that all of this information is current as of today, uh, June 27th of 2022. So if you're watching this on demand, uh, this guidance may be a little uh, uh, outdated. We do encourage you always to go to the NIH or IDSA uh, guidelines for the most contemporary guidance. So the learning objectives we have for this program today are to discuss the nature and frequency of the post-acute sequel of sequelae of SARS-CoV-2 infection or PASC syndrome, uh, and to describe the current management strategies uh, and kind of identify approved, authorized, and in-development treatments for patients with COVID-19 requiring hospitalization. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you this afternoon. It's a pleasure to join you. Um, as with all things COVID, this, my, the, my presentation will be based on our current knowledge, but we know that information is rapidly evolving, and I'll be focusing mostly on an adult population. However, we know that long COVID also affects pediatric patients as well. Um, so why does long COVID matter? The first thing is we know that uh, over 85 million people within the United States alone have been diagnosed with COVID, and it's estimated that up to one in five adults will develop some sort of post-COVID condition. This represents a significant number of the population. This will uh, has a significant strain on our healthcare system that will be ongoing, as well as the significant strain on the workforce, and this also will include the healthcare workforce, as many people are unable to return to work due to the severity of their illness. And overall, at this point, we need to better understand understand the syndrome of long COVID so we know where to intervene. And some of the initial steps are just learning the epidemiology, who's affected the different phenotypes of uh, disease, and then how do we better identify, target, and study these individuals. Uh, oops. Uh, the first thing is just understanding the basic terminology. There's a lot of different uh, names for this syndrome, but they all mean the same thing. The terms long COVID, long haul COVID, and COVID long hauler are common what we'll see in the press um, and in the community. Post-COVID syndrome and post-COVID conditions are typically what this, how the CDC and the WHO refer to this syndrome. And then post-acute post sequelae of SARS-CoV-2 or PASCs is how the NIH typically refers to it. But as you can tell, that's a mouthful, so it's much easier um, to refer to it as others. And going forward, I'll probably be bouncing around between long COVID and post-COVID syndrome, but again, it's the same, same syndrome that we're describing. And then when we move on to look at what exactly is the syndrome of long COVID, the CDC defines a, a post-COVID condition as any physical or mental health condition that occurs greater than four weeks after SARS-CoV-2 infection. And the WHO characterizes it slightly different as any um, development of symptoms starting usually three months after the onset of COVID-19 with symptoms lasting for at least two months and cannot be explained by any other symptoms or any other uh, illness. Um, and then 
within this, there's not a spe specific criteria for what is needed to constitute long COVID. So it's a general constellation of symptoms that are new or ongoing from your initial and from the initial infection. Um, and notably, this is distinct from some of the other post COVID events, um, such things as post intensive care syndrome, which is its own entity, but experienced by many patients who have had critical COVID distinct from multi-system inflammatory syndrome, both in children and in adults. Um, it does, it's different from the system or organ specific pathology that we know happens from COVID illness. For example, something like lung fibrosis, where we understand that pathophysiology and direct link on the virus to the organ of impact, as well as different from chronic fatigue syndrome or myalgic encephalomyelitis. And the biggest thing is we're still working to define the syndrome and there might be sub phenotypes or subgroups within the syndrome. So right now we just have an umbrella catch all term. And what are the most common, what are the symptoms? They're really wide and varied. There's been reported over 200 different symptoms that have been attributed to the post-COVID condition um, with almost every body system in, included. The most common ones here are bolded, particularly things like fatigue, post-exertional malaise, brain fog, cognitive impairment, dyspnea, or increased respiratory effort and chest pain. But again, this is not an exhaustive list. It's just the ones that are more commonly noted. Um, and then when we look at uh, who is who are developing these this presentation, we know that at least one in five individuals who survive COVID end up having some sort of post-COVID condition. This is slightly higher in individuals who are over the age of 65. In a prospective self-report study of patients who have had COVID, we've seen that up to 13% have symptoms lasting at least 28 days and that about 2% continue to have symptoms at greater than 12 weeks. One of the key things that we're looking for is does the severity of initial illness um, correlate with the development of post-COVID conditions? And we have seen that the highest rate of post-COVID syndrome does occur in patients who have had more severe illness, required hospitalization, and in particular required um, ICU stay. However, I will say that the majority of people who have had COVID have not all needed to be hospitalized or not all needed intensive care, uh, in intensive care. Um, so the vast majority of people that we might encounter with long COVID are those who are non-hospitalized. Um, and then a lot of the data looking at long COVID is often contracted just into patients who have had COVID, but one of the things we want to compare to is uh, other controls. And this study looked at controls compared to that did not have COVID compared to those who did. And we continued to see the relationship that this post-COVID condition was more commonly seen in those who have had prior COVID. And again, more substantially noted in those who had more severe illness requiring hospitalization and requiring intensive care level stay. Other epidemiologic links that we've seen is other than initial severity of illness that are make people more prone to developing post-COVID has been female sex, older age, pre-existing medical conditions, and this includes things like BMI and more recently noted um, type 2 diabetes, as well as lower socioeconomic stat status. One area of particular interest is what's the impact of vaccination on the development of long COVID. And right now, I think we're still in the learning phase. Early data that looked at um, healthcare, worker, healthcare workers with breakthrough illness, we saw a great impact with vaccination, where vaccination limited the development of long COVID by about 50%. In a more recent study out of a VA population, the risk of vaccine or the risk of long COVID did not show the same protection from vaccine alone. Still, um, there was some impact of vaccination. However, one of the things we have seen is that vaccination consistently has shown to decrease severity of COVID illness. And we know that severity of illness is one of the most consistent things to show development of long COVID. So there is still high impact of vaccine. It's just not the only component to prevent. 
Moving from the general factors of who do we see post-COVID in more looking at host factors and is there anything specific that we can see about hosts or the initial illness itself that might lead people more likely to develop post-COVID syndrome. One study um, with the graphic on the right has shown that viral load during acute infection um, might be linked with the development of post-COVID. Similarly, viral persistence or persistent detection of virus has been uh, shown potential link to post-COVID. Other viral reactivation, particularly with EBV, may be linked to development of post-COVID as well as the development of autoantibodies. Um, additionally, Patients who have had uh, post-COVID syndrome may be more likely to exhibit an abnormal inflammatory profile, which might look like elevated levels of cytokine bio inflammatory biomarkers, um, a specific uh, display of activated innate immune cells, and an altered immunoglobulin, immunoglobulin profile. Then when we look at kind of what's the pathophysiology and what are some of our early understanding of the development of long COVID, it's again, probably an interplay of multiple factors um, between viral persistence, particularly in organs that may harbor the ACE2 receptor where the virus binds to, a state of persistent inflammation with different inflammatory cascade, as well as the development of autoimmune autoimmunity from viral mimicry and development of autoimmune antibodies. And as you can imagine, there's a lot of interplay between those categories. So it's not all happening just in individual silos, but it's the ongoing interaction. And then that might explain some of the post-COVID or the organ-specific damage, but also um, lend an explanation to the post-COVID-19 syndrome. Um, and then further study is needed to see how exactly does this happen. And there's different um, strategies to kind of look into that. One of them is looking for the detection of viral reservoirs, understanding on a molecular and metabolic pathways level, how do some people develop uh, persistent inflammation, um, and then looking at the way the virus triggers specific immune responses. And hopefully with that, that will lead to uh, potential interventions. Um, and then when we move on looking at the natural history of infection, so we know that individuals might, uh, once they develop long COVID, how long is it likely to last? Um, if we can just, uh, Sorry, advance the slide one more. I think the animation got stuck. And one more forward. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, the duration of symptoms can be variable. We see that the recovery of symptoms for many people happens around week four. And that is kind of where the CDC definition of four weeks for post-COVID comes from. Um, more, symptom, more people develop symptom resolution at around 12 weeks, which correlates with the WHO definition. And then after about 12 weeks, symptoms seem to plateau a little bit more. However, um, there is in over time, people do continue to have improvement of their symptoms. However, this is looking at maybe greater than 12 months. The most common symptoms that people seem to relate uh, over periods of time are fatigue and muscle weakness. And then over the course of long COVID, what symptoms are people experiencing? Oftentimes it's a waxing and waning time course. Um, that's not a static symptom group. However, most people, whatever symptoms they have at the initial onset of illness are the same ones that they'll continue with during the duration of illness. It's less common that people will go on to develop new symptoms as time progresses. And then once we have patients in front of us with long COVID, what's the best way to manage um, these patients? The first thing is remembering that this is still remains a diagnosis of exclusion. Um, so it's really important to keep an open mind and take a thorough history. Uh, particular keys within the history of uh, the history and physical exam will be noting the specifics of their COVID illness, particularly the severity of their illness, any treatments they received and their vaccination status as well as being very inclusive with the symptoms and the time course of symptom development because there is not a specific criteria 
of which symptoms are attributed with long COVID, and we're still learning as we go. So considering anything that someone develops newly after COVID as a potential uh, long COVID symptom. Um, on the physical exam, uh, something different to pay attention to would be including an ambulatory pulse oximetry to particularly in those patients who present with a lot of breathlessness or shortness of breath complaints as well as orthostatic vital signs particularly in individuals who are having complaints of lightheadedness um, racing heart or arrhythmia symptoms uh, in terms of diagnostic, there's not one diagnostic that will make the diagnosis of long COVID. Um, there, it's not one particular lab or imaging study. It's always helpful to have some basic laboratory evaluation. That way you can rule as a way to rule out other treatable conditions. Um, same with imaging, looking for particular organ specific pathology. Any spe specialty testing is usually best reserved to after 12 weeks of that initial infection when we start to see the plateau of symptoms. And just a reminder of ordering with intention outside of research studies, if we don't have an action to do with certain labs, um, it might cause the patient more stress than benefit if we don't have an actionable item. Um, and just a reminder that normal laboratory evaluation does not exclude um, the potential of a post-COVID condition. Um, and kind of managing the patient itself can be challenging. I think first and foremost is really forming a partnership with the patient, um, validating what they're experiencing and their experience with long COVID, discussing and acknowledging that there are knowledge gaps right now in, the, uh, in what we understand with long COVID and the best treatments, and focusing on developing strategies that'll help with their symptom management for improved quality of, for their improved quality of life. The second, kind of tenant of treatment would be not to do any harm, particularly outside of a research study, not, um, not using any treatments that do not have an evidence-based um, rationale behind them because there are potential for all treatments to have adverse effects. Um, there are a lot of uh, treatments being circulated in different um, social media post-COVID communities, and it's helpful to kind of be aware of what they are so that you can uh, have a discussion with your patient about the potential risks and benefits and how much is known and what are the limitations of our knowledge. Comprehensive rehabilitation programs, um, including physical therapy, occupational therapy, and cognitive rehab have been shown to be helpful um, to improve uh, quality of life for patients. Um, focusing on managing existing medical conditions so that nothing worsens um, during their focus on their long COVID symptoms. And really important, I think, is attention to mental health care because we know that COVID alone can cause some of the post-COVID symptoms can be anxiety and depression. And then additionally, many of these patients are now adjusting to life with a chronic medical illness and that alone comes with a lot of um, mental health burden. As of June 2021, there is a ICD-10 code that can be used to categorize these post-COVID conditions, and that's always helpful to use. That way, in future studies, we can look back and see how many people were affected by this. Um, so some of the challenges, we hope to have ongoing research with long COVID. However, some of the challenges um, do stem from some of the variability in the case definition. Um, particularly what gets reported by healthcare professionals, how's that documented, and the various nebulous terms and different descriptions of long COVID. Um, additionally, many studies might not have control groups at this time, so it's hard to generalize the effects of specifically COVID-19 versus the overall pandemic conditions that we're all surrounded with. Um, there's also limitations based on access to healthcare. Not everybody had access to healthcare testing, and some individuals might not have continued access to healthcare, particularly some of these individuals, if their healthcare is tied to their employment and they can't work, it's kind of a self perpetuating cycle um, that they're then not able to have access to healthcare, and we can't capture that population. Um, and then also the challenges of dealing with something that has a long duration of illness. We're talking on the order of months to years. Uh, so retention and care and studying this population is, um, can be difficult. The other things uh, that can be challenging is that they're changing variables within uh, COVID itself. So that can also have a secondary impact on long COVID, particularly 
um, different variants. We know that they cause different severity of illness, but will they impact the development of long COVID the same way as unknown? Uh, vaccination status and impact on long COVID is unknown as well. Um, whether or not early initiation of antivirals or other COVID therapeutics can halt or stop the product progression to long COVID is also unknown. And then what is, what's the impact of our of prior infection and natural immunity on the development of long COVID? These are questions that are still um, yet to be answered. Um, however, I think we do have some good news that there's more focus now on long COVID research. Um, within the US, the NIH has uh, funded the Recover Initiative, um, which is a collaborative effort between both community partners as well as the medical community and scientists with over 100 researchers and multiple studies ongoing to hopefully forward our understanding and knowledge and treatment options for um, patients uh, living with long COVID. And then um, one resource that has a list of these studies is studies.recovercovid.org. And um, sometimes I've offered that as a option for patients to look into, the patients that are interested, help them feel empowered and involved in research as we all learn and move forward together. Yeah, uh, Jana had a wonderful overview of uh, long COVID and those practical conditions. I mean, so much of it resembles what we do with other post-viral syndromes after mono or after Lyme disease, for example. Um, uh, I find I have to borrow from, you know, anxiety, depression, treatments, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, uh, any particular attributes that you find more successful than others, or is it really a tailored approach at the moment that, that you're recommending? Yeah, so I uh, typically re recommend a more tailored approach, and I because the ver there's such variability in terms of what people are presenting with and what is going to make their life get back to where they want to be. So it's very more symptom specific and specific on what their recovery goals are. Um, and ex really explaining that it's going to take time. And unfortunately, there's nothing we can do to speed up a lot of time. Um, I have referred often to um, our physical therapy and occupational therapy colleagues. Um, and I think they've done a great job in helping people make functional gains so that they can day to day their lives become a little easier. Right. Yeah. No, I, I agree. I think that's quite a <clears throat> practical approach. Well, I'm going to go ahead now and share uh, my screen. And uh, what we're going to do over some remaining minutes is to uh, give a brief overview of where we are with uh, therapeutics, especially some of the more recent changes as the virus continues to evolve. And then touch on the latest, which isn't really a pandemic response, but the, the emerging monkeypox outbreak, which has certainly gone far beyond prior outbreaks and uh, how that may be affecting uh, your patients and as you evaluate. Uh, this is a slide that's about six months old, but I wanted to give you a sense that uh, we do have a fair number of therapeutics. I'm not going to touch on much for hospitalized patients, which has been fairly static uh, now with remdesivir, dexamethasone, also with adjunctive tocilizumab or baricitinib for uh, the most ill patients. But where there, of course, have been vast changes has been oral therapy, but also how antibody treatments continue to be affected as we move through uh, the pandemic and uh, the virus continues to evolve. As a quick reminder, uh, anything under uh, emergency use authorization by the FDA uh, is being targeted towards people at high risk for COVID-19. Uh, and uh, you have a menu of particular items here. The one thing that I did want to uh, note is uh, in mid-June, the CDC did update criteria, a criterion for age where it was formerly over 65, but it's now um, uh, 50 and older. And don't forget pregnancy and a BMI that can be just in the overweight category over 25. Now, uh, as we move through um, our prevention or treatments, we're of course not tackling vaccines today, but for people that uh, do not uh, respond to the vaccine, especially our immunosuppressed populations, pre-exposure prophylaxis 
is an option uh, with tixagivimab, silagivimab, and that's that very long-acting antibody with a modified FC component uh, that has a very long half-life. And the initial EUA approval was based on the PROVENT trial, which really looked at all comers, not just the immunosuppressed population, and found a substantial reduction. Um, now, granted, these were in unimmunized people who then got this long-acting antibody, which was very effective while this study was ongoing during the Alpha and Delta variants. Um, this is a Kaplan-Meier curve to give you an idea of how well this worked. I'll note that it doesn't work that well in the first two weeks because actually from the intramuscular injection uh, for the antibodies to get into uh, mucosal and respiratory tissues takes some time. So uh, it's not approved uh, for treatment or post-exposure prophylaxis because essentially the antibodies don't work fast enough. Uh, the EUA indications are anyone 12 and older uh, who have moderate to severe immunocompromise. So this could be people with B-cell disorders, solid organ transplants, or have a known lack of response to the vaccine, or uh, have had a severe reaction to SARS-CoV-2 vaccine and uh, cannot take any uh, vaccine um, in this case. Now, one of the flies in the ointment, of course, is that uh, the viruses continue to evolve. The darker purples are the uh, original Omicron that uh, sort of hit us uh, right after Delta in December. But really now the predominant uh, sublineage variant is uh, BA2.12.1, but this now is being replaced by uh, BA4 and BA5. And this is really what's been happening in Europe, and we seem to uh, have uh, changes here about a month after what's being seen in the UK and elsewhere. But of course, we're not really uh, testing as much. So our ability to get a, a clear snapshot is much less than earlier in the pandemic. In vitro studies, uh, which are shown here in a very handy NIH website, show that with the predominant circulating current sublineage, that the combination of the two antibodies, which does go by the trade name Evusheld, um, has about a tenfold decrease compared to the ancestral Wuhan strain and Delta, um, uh, but probably are still effective. Now, when it comes to BA4 and 5, however, there's a further reduction that at least so far appears to be about 10 to 30 fold, in part because everything now is really dependent on only one of the monoclonals, the silgivimab, at least by in vitro studies. Um, and the sole uh, tixagivimab study showed really uh, no impact on these <clears throat> newer uh, subvariants. So how well uh, this uh, particular approach will work moving ahead remains unclear. Uh, the dose, though, was increased, acknowledging that there was reduction in uh, in vitro activity against Omicron back in February, raising the dose from 150 of each to 300 and is still dosed at every six months. In the initial uh, study, there was some more cardiac events in the active arm in anyone with pre-existing cardiac disease. And at least some of our practitioners uh, in our health system do at least talk to patients about that uh, while they're considering them for immunization. As I already mentioned, it is not for uh, post-exposure prophylaxis. In fact, post-exposure prophylaxis, which uh, there were drugs uh, approved for this, included uh, casirivimab and divimab, as well as bamlanivimab and etisivimab. But those have been withdrawn because they, although they had studies backing the indications, they were on earlier variants and did not have sufficient activity against Omicron. So we're really left with no post-exposure prophylaxis interventions, really uh, the reason then to uh, truly encourage immunization. But while we move to early treatment, and these are again gonna be for people that don't require uh, oxygen and so on, the oral antivirals have certainly been helpful. And there was a, you know, both problems with finding the drug early on and also adoption. But now I think it, it's been increasingly used. It's now the most common drug employed against uh, COVID-19. And nermtrelivir is a specific SARS-CoV-2 protease inhibitor, which means it inhibits 
Um, the protease, which is meant to cleave a non-structural protein that is directed by the virus made by the host cell and therefore will interrupt assembly of additional virus. Um, it is excreted renally, uh, has minimal metabolism, and is a twice a day drug. And its approval was based on the EPIC trial, uh, which you see here, which uh, was able to yield a nearly 90% reduction, again, in predominant in, on immunized people. So uh, there'll be less impact, although a recent Israeli study uh, suggests, especially in older adults, that the drug still had a role uh, and reduced a serious illness and hospitalization in people that were immunized. It was generally well tolerated. The problems are that it does require renal dosing, especially for a GFR between 30 and 60. If it's your GFR is under 30, um, we really don't have dosing data for that. And of course, the other major issue is drug interactions uh, because of the ritonavir. It's approved for anyone 12 and older, and you need to have less than five days of symptoms because early intervention is what correlates best with um, impact by an antiviral in these acute infections and um, is not authorized for use in patients hospitalized due to COVID, as I mentioned, is twice a day for five days. Um, the major problem, as mentioned, is ritonavir for those of you that uh, have taken care of HIV patients. Ritonavir is a potent uh, substrate for uh, cytochrome uh, 3A4. Uh, in fact, it's a suicide inhibitor, so it, it irreversibly binds and has many, many drug interactions. So by all means, do a drug interaction check with all medications uh, before uh, considering. This is just a small list of uh, the ones that are in the uh, prescribing information, uh, but there's really many more, and I just encourage you to use a uh, qualified uh, drug interaction checker like University of Liverpool, for example, uh, Lexicomp, uh, or uh, another drug database of your uh, um, uh, preference. Um, now, this uh, uh, protease inhibitor is uh, indeed preferred because in trial was uh, certainly um, uh, with that close to 90% reduction in evolution of severe illness, highly effective. Uh, another antiviral, which is molnupiravir, a nucleotide analog, was also studied. However, this only had a 30% reduction in hospitalization or death, um, although you can see there was uh, a trend towards reduced deaths. Uh, generally well tolerated, this drug does not have the drug interactions uh, that the protease inhibitor combination has, um, but it, it does have potential for genotoxicity, so not advised for uh, people that are pregnant. Uh, for example, uh, sexually um, active women should uh, uh, provide contraception, um, and men uh, may have impact on spermatogenesis for up to three months. It's also used within the first five days of illness, um, taken twice a day, uh, four capsules twice a day. <clears throat> and again, it's only for outpatient uh, uh, COVID-19, so people with symptoms not requiring hospitalization. Now for drugs by injection, uh, remdesivir, uh, I think will again be used a little bit more based on the pine tree trial trial that was stopped prematurely because monoclonals came out. But you can see also had a very uh, 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 protease inhibitor-like impact with a nearly 90% reduction in hospitalization or death. Also substantial reduction need for medical visits following a three-day infusion if uh, received within the first seven days of symptom onset. Remdesivir tends to be well tolerated. Of course, the problem is logistics because you need uh, three days of infusion with a first dose at 200 milligrams followed by 100 milligrams each day. So it's something which certainly um, you need certain centers or home infusion uh, that's capable of performing. Uh, certainly the monoclonals have been far easier as a one and done administration. Uh, bed pilavimab, uh, some people have been reluctant because there's not much data other than in vitro data to suggest its use. I will tell you in our health system, we think it's worked very well and we've been targeting it towards the most high risk 
uh, adults, those that may not respond well to immunization, have B-cell disorders like CLL or have received rituximab because, as I mentioned, our supply is dwindling, uh, but uh, had a modest amount of uh, uh, data uh, that was in the uh, uh, briefing document presented to the F, uh, uh, FDA here. So we really don't have the same kind of clinical data that came with earlier EUA approvals. Um, there's also convalescent plasma, which has really fallen out of favor. In fact, uh, is predominantly used in our health system for hospitalized immunosuppressed patients. Um, it's only high titer. The FDA is uh, changed its um, <clears throat> approval for only in immunosuppressed patients, which could include outpatient. And probably the best uh, prospective trial uh, uh, was uh, published in this spring, uh, showing a over 50% reduction in hospitalization or death uh, in those that received it as an outpatient. Uh, so early administration of high titer is effective. And in fact, Maybe something which, as this virus evolves, if we can't keep up with monoclonals, uh, may be uh, returning to this. I'll mention uh, part of its bad reputation is that there were a lot of uh, trials in hospitalized patients where the uh, plasma was uh, administered very late at day seven, nine, 10, or later, and uh, you're not going to have much impact there. You do have to administer it early. For those of the, you that uh, maybe um, uh, trying to navigate uh, what to give your patients. This is a handy outpatient roadmap uh, put together by the Infectious Disease Society of America. The URL is on the slide. I won't go through it, but it, it is very helpful to sort of walk through um, just uh, easy responses and questions, as well as how many symptom days your patient has had symptoms and what treatments might be available. Um, lastly, I'll just mention, at least within our health system, we've placed monoclonals above uh, remdesivir, uh, whereas um, the NIH and others uh, sort of put remdesivir because they have a better evidence basis above the monoclonal, and but clearly molnupiravir is at the bottom. And uh, uh, Dr. Williams, um, how, how are things in your health system uh, there? Um, do you... Do you have any kind of prioritization scheme for your current use for antivirals or what's your approach? Yeah, so I think kind of similar. Some of it is based on the severity or the severity of host immunostatus. If they're more severely immunocompromised, trying to get the monoclonal antibodies is preferred, oftentimes because these patients are often have a lot of drug-drug interactions with the with the uh, Paxlovid, so they're not yeah. able to access that. Um, I work also in an inpatient rehab facility, so um, there the access to medication is a little different. So for lower for low acuity illness, but with uh, multiple comorbidities, I use the remdesivir because we have a captive patient population um, to hopefully prevent the development of severe illness. So I think it's a little bit across the board based on what's available, what the patient factors are and what other medications, but yeah. um, definitely the top two are kind of our favored treatment. If patients yeah. are in the hospital, um, and they're hospitalized because now I think it's more common that they're getting hospitalized for reasons other than COVID, mm -hmm. um, but then they happen to test positive. That's another situation where we'll um, use remdesivir. Yeah, and very much the same. Thank you. Um, and a, a few uh, remaining minutes, um, I'd like to just bring up monkeypox, our newest um, emerging infectious disease that needs to be considered. Uh, WHO is entertaining uh, renaming it since the real reservoir is in rodents, not in monkeys, it so seems. Uh, from a few days ago, this is the global outbreak map with the largest number of cases in the United Kingdom, uh, Germany, and Spain, uh, clearly in Europe, but a um, uh, number of cases worldwide are now over 42 countries and increasing in the United States again from a few days ago. Uh, these were the states where uh, uh, cases have been confirmed, but this is sure to expand. Um, it appears that uh, like all uh, uh, ortho uh, pox transmissions, uh, this really comes from interaction uh, with uh, active skin lesions or mucous membranes and shedding uh, of secretions, although a respiratory droplet is possible. 
this current outbreak seems to be mostly traced to social networks and men who have sex with men, um, as well as bisexual uh, networks, but may uh, expand beyond that, certainly. Um, but this is where it's being seen. And, and therefore, uh, I think, uh, really think about this, especially in someone with proctitis, uh, genital lesions, oral ulcers, for example, or of course, any emerging um, uh, rash that looks like it's becoming vesicular pustular. I have some pictures in a moment. The incubation seems to be on average a week or two after a contact now, not everyone is sick. Some people just have a rash. Uh, other people have a viral-like prodrome uh, with nonspecific symptoms, but can include cough and sore throat. There can be lymphadenopathy, uh, either in the neck or in the inguinal regions. Uh, historically, at least with cases that were uh, seen more in children uh, in Africa, uh, often uh, the first uh, uh, lesions were seen on the face. Um, uh, in the current 2022 outbreak, it's more oral, genital, or anal, and then uh, may spread elsewhere in the body, but can also stay limited to that section. Uh, can start off as macules uh, that then evolve into papules, pustules, or uh, so on, and usually will crust within about two weeks. The uh, skin lesions, uh, again, do look like uh, pustules, uh, um, uh, vesicles. Uh, you might think they're chicken pox. Of course, in the genital regions, you could think about uh, uh, syphilis, um, herpes, LGB. Uh, don't forget proctitis, where you may not have anything apparent um, and will crust often in about a week. Uh, the diagnosis is by uh, a swab or fluid material subjected to PCR. Uh, these are often being done in state or local health departments with confirmation at the CDC. Many academic centers are developing in-house testing, and I'm sure there'll be wider uh, incorporation of testing uh, if indeed monkeypox remains uh, with us uh, for time. And certainly the extent of the outbreak suggests this is not probably going away. You should isolate until all lesions are crusted in the household to prevent uh, contact to others. And treatment, uh, because this is milder, uh, there have been no deaths uh, known yet. Um, uh, a lot of times this just appears to improve. The CDC says that if you have a severe case that's hospitalized, which is definitely a minority of patients, if you're immunocompromised, uh, young children, pregnant or have uh, chronic skin conditions, may want to consider treatment, but I'll mention colleagues um, at the Centers for Disease uh, Control, I'm sorry, colleagues in uh, the United Kingdom, where there are the largest number of cases, have been unimpressed with any of the oral treatments, the Brin Sidofavir or Tecviramat. So I, I don't know how much this uh, likely benefits and uh, at least for people that generally have intact immune systems. Uh, there are uh, vaccines, including the old smallpox va uh, vaccine, modified uh, vaccinia attenuated, but also a newer version uh, available on a limited basis, at least through the CDC for both uh, immunizing contacts potentially or uh, even adjunctive therapy for people. Um, so in closing, I would say uh, certainly you heard uh, some fantastic information about uh, long COVID. Uh, we have much to learn there. Um, on the uh, SARS-CoV-2 side, uh, immunization and treatment may reduce the impact of long COVID. Uh, and most importantly, that with continued viral evolution, there will be changes likely to our antiviral based therapy, antibody based therapies. Uh, hopefully, the oral therapies will remain effective. And of course, monkeypox, at least at the moment, consider it uh, now for STDs. But if you have any unexplained chickenpox like illness, I would certainly incorporate that into uh, consideration. Wonderful. Well, we are going to move into the Q&A. Um, thank you to everybody who has um, stayed with us uh, to the bottom of the hour. So um, as a reward, we're going to answer some questions now. So um, please do enter any questions that you have, because even if we don't get to them today, we just might answer them in our next one. So stay tuned. Um, our first question here, um, and this, I'll let you both decide if you want to answer it. Um, 
separately, um, but for older patients who were vaccinated against smallpox in the 1950s, do these patients re retain memory cells that may help against today's monkeypox? Well, maybe I'll just start off with that. I mean, one of the reasons it's believed that monkeypox is emerging, and it seems to be especially in younger sexually active populations, is this is a group that was not immunized. Um, and that may have been one reason we haven't seen widespread um, monkeypox outbreaks, despite the fact that it's been circulating, you know, in, in Africa for many years. So um, whether someone still has protective immunity that's, um, uh, you know, 60, 70 uh, years old is unclear. Uh, but uh, the thought is there's probably still some retained immunologic memory uh, potentially that could have some cross uh, reaction and uh, activity, but we, we won't know until there's more people exposed in those age ranges. Okay, and our next question, what do we know about rebound, a rebound after treatment with neuromeltrevir? How common is it? Janet, you, I'd be happy to answer that. Or what's your, what are, what are you telling your patients? Sure. I think early on, there were a lot more anecdotal reports that there were people seeing a lot more rebound illness and rebound symptoms and repeat positive tests. But I think now there's more data coming out that that rebound phenomenon might not be as common as people initially thought. Um, so I think it's still a good option for patients to be able to use and potentially use with confidence. But we'll have to keep a close eye, particularly on the patients who are higher risk for prolonged viral um, replication, particularly our immunocompromised patients, to see what happens after that. Yeah, the, the, the uh, EPIC trial deep in the FDA briefing material had you know, data that showed that both people that received the drug and those that didn't both had this rebound phenomenon. And, you know, estimates are maybe 2% of people, but, you know, I'm not sure how accurate that is. No one wants to restart a five-day isolation, of course, with rebound symptoms. Um, but uh, by and large, if anyone has severe uh, or risk factors for severe disease, I think it's still highly recommended that they take the drug, whether they're immunized or not. Fantastic. Our um, next and possibly final question here is, what is the name of the monkeypox vaccine and is it available in the USA? Well, uh, there is, uh, there are two. There's the um, MVA, the old smallpox uh, vaccine, which, um, you know, has been in stockpile for years. <clears throat> since 9-11 um, and is a some question as to how active it is. Uh, the newer one is called Genios, a, uh, also a modified vaccinia um, uh, 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 vaccine. Uh, it's non-replicative and has fewer potential side effects. So that would be the preferred one, although it's available in limited supply, they are manufacturing more. Um, it has uh, thought to have broad orthopox activity, but at the moment, uh, it would have to be uh, acquired or through direction through the local health department and so on. Um, in the United Kingdom, they are starting to immunize high risk groups, or that's what they'd like to do. Uh, so uh, people who have sex with men, gay men, um, and uh, uh, there is some discussion along those lines uh, in the U.S. as well. Wonderful. Well, um, it, that does conclude our Q&A for today. Um, thank you again to everybody who stuck with us until now. Uh, for our audience, if you'd like to claim credit, please click on that claim credit button. It will appear um, when the webcast ends as well. And be on the lookout for our 30-day survey. You'll get that in your email. Um, as always, your responses to this will help us develop further education like this. And to our podcast listeners, please rate and review. It only takes a few seconds, but it really helps us grow our channel and our reach. Um, and for those joining us on YouTube, be sure to take the post test into the description to claim CME credit. Uh, and don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel to never miss our future videos. So uh, thank you. We'll see you again soon. And to Dr. Altwater and Dr. Williams, um, thanks again. Take care. Thank Thanks for listening.